All right, friends, it's time to go to work. Today we will be talking about sports broadcasting. So while we're going through this chapter in this PowerPoint, uh, it might be helpful to think about these questions. What is broadcast? What is media rights? And why is it important for a league or a team to establish media rights plans? And what are media rights plans? Um, Today, uh, the sale of media rights is a tremendous source of revenue for many sports properties. And the demand for sports media has increased due to subscription television and also digital media platforms, which we'll talk about. Both of these mechanisms, these platforms, use sports events and games and are released as programming as a manner to drive ratings and therefore uh, uh, generate subscriptions amongst consumers, fans, what have you, and hopefully retain those fans, those subscriptions, and then drive advertising revenues. We are also seeing uh, the rise of these cable networks or other platforms involving niche broadcasters that target programming to a specific segment that's of interest to small parts of the public. And we're seeing sports cable networks that are able to tap in to different revenue streams, advertising revenues, so as subscriber fees to attract a uh, more and better programming that generates uh, pretty substantial financial results. And um, we're seeing this uh, in an age where creating uh, new broadcast networks is becoming increasingly easier in comparison to, say, um, the history of sports broadcasting. So it's helpful to kind of look into the past. Um, in the 1800s, uh, we, with the creation of electronic communication uh, through the telegraph and, and then the telephone, uh, led to the creation of broadcasting in a sense because local stations across the country were a lot were able to broadcast the same event um, through these different uh, mediums. And then by World War One, the wireless radio had been established. And then we see um, the radio being used uh, in a way to broadcast, uh, um, disseminating information uh, through a medium to a wide range of people who consume it in mass simultaneously. Um, and we saw that with the Pittsburgh uh, baseball team broadcasting uh, in the first live sport program, or I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry, the Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh broadcast the first live uh, boxing match, which was the first live sports program. But then we had uh, the Pirates and the Phillies uh, not that long after broadcasting their first game. And uh, in a sort of landmark uh, victory for uh, professional sports teams and, and the sport broadcasting community as a whole, uh, a federal court ended up ruling that that the home team to this contest would be able to control the broadcasting rights to a sport event. So therefore, um, a rogue sort of um, announcer group couldn't sit on an elevated space, let's say on a rooftop, and peer into a sports stadium and call the game and broadcast that game. Instead, that sports uh, team that was the home team controlled the broadcast rights, and hence the monopoly on that and what led to the first revenue generation through sport broadcasts. And of course, uh, radio's ability to reach a national audience helped to popularize a sport broadcasting and then bring on those revenue generation opportunities. Um, however, there were some worries, uh, you know, with any new medium uh, coming of age, whether it's radio or television or new media, um, people get worried, uh, owners get worried that people are going to stay home and not go to the games, which will cut uh, away at the revenues from the gate. But of course, that has somewhat of a de minimis of effect usually. Um, so after radio was invented, we travel to the 1950s and we see television replacing radio as sort of the premier mass medium uh, method. And as technology 
increased in terms of television. We see uh, different uh, advancements occurring. So in the 60s, uh, Monday Night Football, or, um, um, ABC Sports uh, comes uh, into being and uh, ABC hires Rune Arledge uh, as the executive for ABC Sports. Uh, Rune Arledge creates Monday Night Football. He creates um, all these other different ways to take people to uh, the football games. We see uh, the commissioner of the NFL in the 60s, Pete Rozelle, come to power, and he really embraces um, uh, television and broadcast media as a way to um, bring uh, popularize the game, uh, taking fans to the game. Um, and in the 60s, the AFL teams with ABC to broadcast uh, professional football. And we see, again, more innovative ways to bring the fans to the game uh, through the using the unique technology of uh, television, television angles, microphones, instant replay, um, and getting up close and personal um, with the athletes uh, as a way to supplement what's going on on the field. And that really culminates uh, with Monday Night Football being created in, in 1970 with Rune Arledge. Now, I mentioned Pete Rozelle, uh, who was the commissioner of the NFL at the time, and he really helped move the National Football League in a real quantum leap forward, leapfrogging any of the other professional sports leagues to become the premier league uh, within the United States. Uh, and a lot of that was done and, and is owed to uh, him in the league and him in, uh, in um, um, convincing the owners of the NFL to embrace television as a medium. And he convinced all of the NFL owners to pool their broadcast rights um, from going from an individual sort of uh, territory of exclusivity and allowing only, you know, each team to get, like baseball traditionally, um, a team usually gets their own broadcast deal and they keep their broadcast revenue rights, whoever they sell those broadcast rights to, um, to broadcast, um, let's say, Detroit Tigers games. But Roselle convinced um, the owners of the league that they were stronger as a sum as opposed to individuals because when the Dal when, when the Green Bay Packers win in terms of being able to generate revenue, even though it's a small market team, the Dallas Cowboys win even though it's a large market team. So um, he he convinced the NFL to pool their uh, pool their broadcast rights and sell them uh, to the highest bidder, um, and then all of those revenues would be uh, shared equally um, amongst all the things that was called. It was called revenue sharing. However, this, of course, was an antitrust violation because it it, it prevented it, it prevented um, each team individually from selling their rights, which uh, stifled competition. But in a stroke of genius, uh, Roselle actually helped lobby for the creation of the Sport Broadcasting Act, which is a congressional uh, it's a it's a uh, it's a congressional law. It's a federal law that. Uh, that granted all the professional sports immunity from antitrust about broadcasting. And um, two of the major, one, actually, I can't remember the other one, but one of the senators who really helped move this bill along was the senator from Louisiana. And then lo and behold, uh, a year or so later, the New Orleans Saints came into existence after the Sport Broadcasting Act was passed. And, you know, perhaps it was a bit pre quid pro quo. Well, we'll if you scratch our back, we'll give you a, a new sports team. So, Everyone's happy. We see more evolutions with in-sport broadcasting. NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament uh, Championship uh, is first uh, televised, and then we see HBO uh, uh, broadcasting boxing uh, via satellite. Um, not, then we see more satellite with a uh, Turner uh, create, uh, creating TBS uh, and signaling in, uh, and and uh, sharing it via satellite. And then 1979, ESPN starts, which is the first 24-hour a day uh, sports and entertainment uh, television network. And so, so then um, we see in the 1980s again um, the legal system uh, that or the, the laws that traditionally prevented um, college uh, college teams from appearing more than once uh, a year 
uh, by rule of the NCAA was challenged uh, in court. So um, what had happened was the University of Oklahoma did not like the fact that per NCAA rules, they could only get one national television appearance a year, uh, which was the same amount as say the University of um, uh, the University of Poughkeepsie or the Eastern Michigan University's marginal universities. And uh, since Oklahoma was good, they wanted to, in the perennial power, they wanted more appearances on television. So again, uh, they used antitrust law to sue the NCAA uh, to try to um, uh, say that this restriction on how many times a team can appear on television was unconstitutional, ultimately winning at the Supreme Court uh, level. And so that created the freedom for um, teams to be broadcast more times on television, which um, led to uh, greater exposure through television. 1990s, it accelerates for broadcast. So DirecTV is created. The internet uh, becomes more popularized. Uh, other forms of multimedia help to popularize sport and sport broadcasting. ESPN2 launches. The X Games is created. So all of these things happen in the 1990s. And then the 2000s, uh, HDTV or high definition television is created. Again, a new technological uh, development. And again, NFL owners or professional sports owners become scared that this will keep people at home and prevent them from coming to the to the games if they're able to watch high definition television from the comfort of their own home. Of course, that doesn't happen. Um, the speeds of high uh, of internet uh, increase. So we see um, again broadband being able to deliver um, high uh, high data uh, television uh, uh, quality to their uh, to their televisions and uh, then in the latter parts of the 2000s we see a migration from traditional broadcast uh, through the television and now going to the internet and we see digital networks at the college level the professional level and then we also see uh, different leagues launching their own networks like the NFL network or the NHL network or MLB network and so we see all these different proliferations of broadcast networks. And this is then drives revenues. Um, and you see right here, now we've got smart TVs that automatically have internet programming uh, being delivered right to our television. So there's different methods of delivery, which I was just saying, uh, over the air broadcasting, which is free, uh, a broadcast signal is sent unencrypted uh, to your television, and then it's it's uh, you, you watch it on the receiver. Uh, we then also see uh, more traditionally now cable. Uh, cable is a video service that uses cable networks, uh, whether it's through wiring, uh, digital wire, uh, fiber optic cable, or coax cable, and satellite to subscribers. And we see comprehensive uh, carriage packages involving sports. Um, and uh, this is kind of the standard. Um, you can also pay for higher. Uh, uh, sort of more um, more comprehensive sport packages, uh, but those are based on subscription fees. So revenue through cable content is generated through uh, advertising revenue, just like over the air um, television, but also subscription fees. So these are monthly payments that the customer care uh, has to pay to the to the company in order for the right to have uh, to watch that channel on their platform. But then the cost is, all right, um, although uh, your cable uh, provider is charging you, they have to pay a certain percentage of that to uh, the sports leagues, like ESPN receives 3 to $4 to $5 uh, per subscription, uh, and they get that from the, the, the cable uh, provider. Then we've got a distri distribution platform, so these will be below... Uh, um, these would be below the ground, um, you know, co companies that we we're just talking about, like Comcast or Time Warner, satellite companies like DirecTV or Dish Network. And uh, again, they're based off of subscribers, uh, but uh, these carriage payments they have to pay are monthly payments to cable channels to carry their platform. But, but this is important because um, these, uh, whether, it's, whether it's satellite or cable, 
having uh, sports uh, as a subscription option drives advertising sales because sports programming is the most popular programming out there. So um, you see that um, on the uh, the right here that the most popular, highly rated uh, events are usually uh, sports league uh, events. So you look at the Super Bowl uh, from this past year and, and look at um, for uh, the most watched TV programs for in terms of total viewers, uh, they're either NFL games, uh, actually they're all Super Bowl games. So it shows how popular it is. So we look at sort of the cost that that networks have to pay for subscription. So ESPN uh, gets paid $6 and change a month. Uh, ESPN2 is $0.74. Cents. Um, the Big Ten Network is $0.38. Cents. Uh, but all these add up. And the Nielsen ratings help substantiate sort of um, the popularity of sports. So Nielsen um, takes uh, calculates a, a rating based on the number of TV households that are turned to a program at a given time. And the share is the percent of TV sets actually tuned to the program as opposed to the household. So um, in terms of now production. Production is um, the process of actually creating the, and capturing and then packaging the content. Um, there are different ways uh, to actually um, capture fees. So it could be a rights and production fee where uh, the network actually pays the holder of that property a rights fee and is responsible for all costs and expenses associated with producing the game for TV and then sells all the ad time itself, retaining all the revenue. There's also rights only where the network pays a rights fee and the organizer then is responsible for the production that must meet, um, oops, sorry, that must meet um, the network standards of quality. And then we've got finally a time buy which is where the organizer buys time on the network and is subject to network quality control and is responsible for the production of sale. So there are th these three different media rights arrangements. And the key terms for negotiation for these rights fees arrangements are the amount of the rights fees, the territory for the telecast uh, where, it can, uh, where it can run and be distributed, the, the term or length of the deal and uh, the process for selecting the game. So uh, the, the list goes on and on. So when, when we're talking about the business of broadcasting and rights fees, it's pretty substantial negotiation. Uh, but once the negotiation is complete, it can be very lucrative. And the lucrative nature of these right, media rights fees has kind of led to the creation of these original sports networks. And these regional sports networks have helped to segment the marketplace uh, and increase the pie. So expanding the size of the audience by creating specific programming to cater to um, potential consumers and then drive up ad revenue by uh, making these markets uh, attractive to specific uh, advertisers. Um, most cable packages actually have the regional sports programs as part of their basic or plus programming. Um, and so these are usually uh, content driven here. So here's an example of a regional sports network, um, Fox Sports Network. And we see uh, that there is quite a few uh, affiliates throughout the nation and that each of them uh, can create programming specific to the region that they serve and that also goes to the advertisers. So Fox Sports Network um, goes to about 83 million uh, households and um, it's able to control the local TV rights of baseball, hockey, and basketball, and also college sports, among other things, high school sports within that, re within that region. So we've talked a lot about broadcast media and then also digital and also um, uh, cable and, and satellite, but we really haven't talked much about um, digital media and the rise of digital media. 
Well, the rise of digital media really has come in the form of websites uh, and applications for uh, mobile technology and uh, also sort of segmented uh, broadcast, um, digital broadcast opportunities and social networking. And again, technology has allowed for the segmentation and, and rise of niche networks and also created the rise of innovative models that are cost effective because um, of the fact that it's digital and there's a little physical cost in terms of the distribution. So um, right now, um, there is a debate within the broadcast community about whether to offer these uh, services for free to grow as many uh, consumers, uh, subscribers as possible, and then make money through advertising or to charge a subscription fee. And so that is um, that is uh, uh, an issue. And also, as time goes on and digital media continues to uh, become the norm within broadcast, it might impact uh, other traditional media uh, broadcast uh, methods like the the over the air or cable. Uh, and also there are some actually wondering if this will actually cut into ticket sales. So um, some of the, the future issues within uh, broadcast is whether or not um, we're gonna, the, the broadcast industry is going to see a continuing rise in court people cutting the cord, walking away from cable or satellite or these comprehensive uh, deals where it's bunt where there's a bundling of uh, sports options and then in exchange just have selective a la carte options. What's going to happen with digital media as it can continue to rise and overtake other forms of media? And what's going to happen with um, niche network, niche sports or regional networks? Um, so we'll see what happens. But hopefully you found this, um, this chapter informative. And uh, I look forward to continuing the conversation uh, offline. Thanks.